3D printing stocks are having a total meltdown, in particular three metal 3D printing stocks, Desktop Metal, Mark Forged, and Velo 3D, which all coincidentally happen to be down 93% since their SPAC debuts. So some questions we want to answer today, what the HE double hockey sticks happened, and more importantly, is there any value to be found here? Now, when we look at year-to-date performance, it's pretty bad. So the NASDAQ has gained 41% year-to-date. These three metal 3D printing stocks have all lost at least 41%. So there's an opportunity cost associated with being invested in these names. And when you look at the market caps of these firms when they had their SPACs, this is remarkable. So we've just plotted that over time. Uh, In blue there, we refer to IPO, their initial public offering, uh, Okay, SPAC merger, same thing, right? Although the difference, of course, is that in an IPO, you have institutional investors vetting the entire process, and with SPACs, you didn't, which is why they were an absolute disaster. So these firms were valued because no institutional investor was vetting them, were valued at $6.2 billion when they debuted to retail investors, and the total value of these firms now is just over $500 million. And who do you think footed that bill? Well, it wasn't the institutional investors that were involved. So when it comes to metal 3D printing, we've been following this theme for a long time. And you can see here just some of the articles that we published. So back in the day when we were looking at 3D printing startups, you see that piece there in 2018, trio of 3D printing startups join Unicorn Club. That was around the time that Desktop Metal reached out to us, and we were talking with uh, various individuals there, uh, including their investor relations team, uh, or at the time they didn't have one, but that was eventually what ended up being the IR team about the prospects of this company, which were very exciting. Well, today, uh, it's not the same company that we were looking at back then. And one of the problems I think here is that um, all three of these companies went public using SPACs. And we've strongly warned against SPACs since the SPAC father uh, introduced them to the retail community. We've covered over 100 disruptive tech SPACs, and you can find all these in our tech stock catalog, which is available to premium subscribers. I pulled that up and went to the um, tab where we list all the companies that are no longer being traded. You can see here a handful of bankruptcies um, that are happening. Uh, We would expect more. At the top, there is a distributed manufacturing company, so that's related to 3D printing. Fast Radius, they went bankrupt. And you look, at, look down the list here, Babylon Health, we took a lot of flack for um, dissecting their business model and pointing out how it was never going to work, and they went bankrupt. So uh, you need to be very careful when you're looking at SPACs. There's 85 left in our catalog that haven't gone bankrupt. Of those, the average has lost 60%. Nearly a quarter of those have lost 90% or more in value. And 55% have lost 75% or more of their value. And the numbers are actually worse than that because now you have these SPACs doing reverse splits. So what happens there is that when we look at these performance numbers, we simply take that $10 issue price they all used and use that to quickly calculate performance. But then when you have a reverse split, the situation for those companies is actually worse. The problem here, as I said, there was no institutional vetting process Uh, And that resulted in bad businesses becoming publicly traded that eventually went bankrupt. And the notion of fair valuation went out the window. And, of course, the father of SPACs, uh, Samir Naina Najjar, said that uh, he was democratizing democratizing access to wealth. Whenever somebody tells you that, uh, just walk away because it always means they're trying to screw you. Uh, The 3D printing thesis in a nutshell is really reflected here, the Star Trek replicator. And when it comes to metal 3D printing, uh, there's you know this idea that you might not need to have auto parts stores holding inventory because you can just print whatever you need on the fly. Uh, as a matter of fact, any metal parts should just be able to be printed on demand. Um, the appeal should extend beyond just prototyping, and that's one of the problems that the entire thesis ran into is it's questionable whether or not it ever will. You have this idea of on-demand printing and then two different business models, whether you own the machines or you farm the workout as Zometry does. Um, Then there's this idea of investing in the metal 3D printing equipment itself, and that's where Mark Forged, Velo 3D, and Desktop Metal come in. And before we start talking about Desktop Metal, I just wanted to touch on who we are. So we're a research firm that focuses on two 
categories of stocks, disruptive growth and dividend growth. Our goal is to teach people how to become better investors. We have two portfolios that sit on each side of that risk spectrum, though a majority of our assets are in our dividend growth strategy. Our next video is going to be on momentum stocks, so make sure that you subscribe. So let's talk about desktop metal. We've published a lot of research, whether that's written or videos on desktop metal. We talked about them a lot, so I don't want to go too much into that. The Stratasys merger, we haven't talked about that. And the reason that we didn't, a lot of premium subscribers asked us to cover this. We said, well, we learned our lesson in the past, uh, getting in front of something that may not ever transpire. And uh, it was a good thing that we didn't because uh, that Stratasys, Stratasys merger, they were going to merge with Desktop Metal. The Stratasys shareholders didn't approve the deal. So that was in September when the deal was announced in May. And then Stratasys says the uh, uh, that they're going to... Um, look for potential strategic alternatives, the kiss of death, right? To be explored or evaluated, not limited to a strategic transaction, potential merger, business combination, et cetera. So when we look at desktop metal, the problem here is that they're not growing their business. And you can see that, oh, and they blame it on the merger. Whatever reasons, macroeconomic headwinds, whatever reasons they want to provide, the fact of the matter is that year over year, they're just not growing their revenues. And when you look at their quarterly guidance there. So um, based on this company's track record of hitting their guidance, I would expect they'd hit on the lower end of that. And the full year 2023 guidance is from 187 to $207 million. So if we look at the last presentation we did on desktop metal, it was looking into 2023 where the company said they were expecting to generate revenue in the range of 210 to 260. That would have been 0% to 24% growth. And what are we actually getting? Well, we're getting uh, no growth at all. We're getting a decline in revenues. If they hit the top end of their 2023 guidance at $207 million, they were ending the year that was in 2022 with $184 million in cash. And the focus has increasingly become on how they plan to preserve that cash. And also note that the high end of 2023 guidance was the same as their 2022 guidance, which was missed by a country mile. So what we want to see for desktop metal, as we said before, better revenue segmentation. There's an unwillingness to provide color on the P50 production platform, which is very concerning. And I looked at the latest call. It's gotten even worse. They've completely swept it under the, the carpet. I think there's one slide in their uh, latest investor deck that shows the P50 at the end in an appendix, and that's about it. They're focused on everything else but Cash, of course, is in focus. They're uh, talking all about how they plan to conserve it. Uh, we said we might check back next year to see how things are going. I don't know if we will. This company has just been a big disappointment. Uh, as I said, the latest earnings call focused on preserving cash, which is good, and they expect their current cash should help them reach positive operating cash flows. But what cre credibility does this management team have left? They're clearly surviving, not thriving. P50 is swept under the carpet. We can't see any reason to invest in this company at any price. Always be wary of stories that change over time when the initial story that was being peddled hasn't panned out. So they couldn't make, make that original value proposition. They couldn't realize value there. What's the likelihood they're going to come up with something else and be a success? It's very low. Now, when we look at companies, we're going to talk about Velo 3D. We look for showstoppers. And uh, this picture I actually took last night at the uh, Kyrgyzstani Opera House in Bishkek. And I learned something new, that a showstopper is actually when the audience claps so much that the show can't continue. And the performers have to kind of sit there and twiddle their thumbs while they're waiting for the, the applause to die down. In, um, at least in my past, in my world, a showstopper has always been the occurrence of an event when you're developing software that won't allow a release to go to market. And, and when you get to that point, there's nothing else really matters. You need to fix that showstopper. When we invest, we look for showstoppers. If there's a problem that we can't get past, why would we spend any more of our time investigating that company if we can't get past that original showstopper. For us, Velo 3D's showstopper was the double-edged sword, their relationship with SpaceX. And you can see this was from one of their investor decks in the past. And we said this in April of 2022, Bulls see SpaceX using Velo 3D printers as a vote of confidence, but it also presents some very heavy customer concentration risk. So that would have been a reason why we wouldn't consider investing in Velo 3D. 
They're now surviving, not thriving. You're going to see that theme throughout this entire presentation. Here on the bottom, this is uh, another kiss of death. In October 2023, so very recently, we made the strategic decision to realign our operations to pivot from emphasizing top-line growth to optimizing free cash flow. Is that because you're not able to realize any more revenue growth? That's probably the case. You can see their quarterly revenues on the decline. But what's more important here we're going to talk about is their largest customer, SpaceX, and they provide us with enough information to do some very interesting math. So in 2021, we know that SpaceX accounted for $7.5 million in revenues. The following year in 2022, it went to $23 million. What about this year? Now, you need to be very careful. So when we were digging through their 10Q filings and looking at this table that you can see here, so this exists in all their 10Q and 10K filings, problem is that those customer numbers aren't static throughout. They're just more of a, of a ranking, so you can't really use those to guide your way through the past data. So we simply took this table. What we can assume based on this is a couple of things. So you can see that on the right, the nine months ended September 30th, 2022. Their biggest customer accounted for 38.6% of revenues at that time. We can assume safely that that's SpaceX. And you see the three months ending in uh, September 30th, 2022. So the third quarter, SpaceX 36%. Now look at current quarter and year to date, less than 10%. What we can assume then is that SpaceX revenue so far this year is less than $7.6 million. What we do know for a fact is that their biggest customer in 2022, safely assume that SpaceX, is not their biggest customer in 2023. That's a problem. Is this bad though, really? Kind of, sort of, because uh, the excessive customer concentration risk, that showstopper, has been removed, right? So we don't have to worry about that anymore, but still, this last quarter, five customers accounted for 77% of revenues. Now, that's certainly more palatable, but things are jumping around all over the place. And what we know for sure is that Mr. First Principles Thinking, who you can see here on the left, he's definitely paying attention. And when we came across this piece from Bloomberg, it was quite an eye-opener. So this startup founded by SpaceX veterans, the name escapes me, and you can read this piece. It's titled, A 3D Printer Isn't Cool. You know what's cool? A 3D printing factory, and it's actually quite a good article. The CEO is a 10-year veteran at SpaceX. His last role is propulsion development manager. They're already printing parts. The idea here is, again, first principles thinking, that you use an entire room to 3D print things. And one could speculate based on this that SpaceX is moving beyond their uh, Velo 3D relationship. But that's not the only problem with Velo 3D. They're now selling more shares to raise money, and their recent funding announcement was just downright bad. So they're selling shares at the market to pay what they call, refer to as the exchange notes. What they did, they borrowed $70 million from a lender with the option for the lender to purchase an additional, additional $35 million in notes. I don't think they're going to be doing that because Velo 3D, according to their last 10Q, says that they were not in compliance with the notes minimum revenue covenant. And as a result, the investor has the right to declare the notes due and payable in cash in an amount equal to the event of default acceleration amount. Who knows what that is, but if the effective interest rate they're paying on their debt is any indication, I don't even want to know. So they state here, the effective interest rate for that debt was 39.9% for the three and nine months ended September 30th, 2023. This company is in a world of hurt. And there are, there are at least a couple showstoppers there. Mark Forge, of the three companies we've talked about today, this is the business model we find most compelling. However, the revenue growth is starting to slide along with gross margins. You can see that here. Uh, we wrote this piece, this was in April 2022 on the right, comparing these, 3D, uh, these three 3D printing firms. And of course, in Mark Forge's latest 10Q, they say, our third quarter results reflect worsening, everybody say it together now, macroeconomic headwinds. That term's used so often, we actually put it on a, a hoodie and it's um, in our merch shop if you're interested. Uh, so 2023 financial guidance for Mark Forged Revenue in the range of 90 to 95 million. So that's going to be less than 2022 revenues. Uh, that sliding gross margin, of course. When you look here at this table, which is great, they break this out, you can see services in, is increasing. Well, that's not scalable. 
because you need to throw headcount at it. But we, we like to see scalability in um, consumables, and those are on the decline. Customers should be using more of the product or say they shouldn't be using less of the product during macroeconomic headwinds. If it's really useful, then they should be continuing to use it or even if it helps save costs using more of it. So this is the first year of revenue declines for Mark Forge. We're going to see what 2024 brings, but this $135 million market cap, way too small to be on our radar. So none of the companies we've talked about today uh, seem to offer um, value, at least from our perspective. But uh, perhaps the most popular desktop metal, as I said, we've written and uh, published videos on this quite extensively. I put the last one here that you may be interested in watching. If you're a desktop metal investor or thinking about investing in the company, you won't want to miss this. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.